Hello again, everyone. Welcome to the final Sunday in April as we continue the season of Easter on our way to Ascension Day and the final Sunday of Easter, better known as Pentecost, the birth of the church, the coming of the Holy Spirit. As scripture says, he ordered them not to leave Jerusalem, but to wait there for the promise of the Father. You will receive power when the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be my witnesses in Jerusalem, in all Judea and Samaria, and to the ends of the earth. This is the season, and that is the ultimate understanding we are headed for. From Easter, we're on our way to Pentecostal power. Once again, we welcome everyone to our service. This is for our third Sunday of Easter, April 26, 2020. My name is Reverend Keith Williams, and I am the pastor of the Louisville South United Methodist Charge in South Winston County, just outside of Louisville, Mississippi. Together, we are three sister churches on the Louisville South Charge. Hope you can come visit us soon at the actual church buildings at Flower Ridge, our campground, our Rocky Hill United Methodist Churches. Again, we have suspended regular worship services because of the COVID-19 pandemic until further notice. Uh, our federal and state uh, leaders are beginning to talk about phasing in a restart of our economy uh, our own governor, uh, Tate Reeves, announced on Friday, April the 26th, that uh, more businesses can open on Monday, but with certain restrictions. Uh, entertainment businesses and businesses requiring person-to-person -person contact will remain closed. Uh, some dental and medical procedures will be allowed with state health department approval. Because we are beginning to see a shift in the way we're thinking as a community, state, and nation. Because we are beginning to see uh, limited openings of certain businesses, uh, you know, a relaxing of the shelter-in-place order, and even encouraging no news on flattening the curve of coronavirus. I am happy to announce to the members of the Louisville South Charge that we are planning our own phase in the beginnings of a limited opening to our churches. Listen carefully. Unless something drastically changes in a profoundly negative way, we are planning drive-in movie-style worship at all three churches beginning the morning of Sunday, May 3rd, first Sunday in May. Note to uh, the charge members that we will not follow our normal timing for first Sunday because first Sunday in May is Memorial Sunday for Flower Ridge Church. Therefore, we are planning drive-in, stay-in-your-vehicle worship for Campground Church at 8.30 a.m., at Rocky Hill Church at 9.45 a.m., and because it is Memorial Sunday for Flower Ridge, they will meet at the 11 a.m. hour. At this first gathering, we will not have Holy Communion, uh, we, we, we generally do on first Sunday. And also our dinner on the grounds, our traditional lunch at Flower, Flower Ridge following the morning service, uh, unfortunately, unfortunately, will not happen. Um, as far as first Sunday in May, try to arrive next Sunday a little early. Uh, when you will arrive, you will find parking attendants giving you directions. So, let's see. Please stay in your vehicle. Also, um, one concern, we've had a lot of people talking about tithing, uh, giving your normal offering to the church during these weeks. 
of not being able to come to church. Uh, we have not been able to pass a collection plate between all three churches in about a month. So next Sunday, May 3rd, we will have some type of drop box that tithes and offerings can be placed on exiting the premises. Uh, the idea is to be able to do this from your car as you drive out. Uh, we are hoping, hoping that in the coming weeks, we will be able to transition in stages back to a normal worship service in the building with everybody back in their particular church pew. This is a time of phases and stages as the world tries its best to get back to normal. Well, that makes today's YouTube service, which for weeks has consisted of yours truly uh, sitting here in my living room at home. Uh, but today's service is potentially the last time we will be, how shall I say, forced to use social media as the method of communication. Uh, as hard as it might be for me to imagine, there may be a few folks who might actually uh, miss us on YouTube. So, to all of you, maybe just only a few of you, I invite you to attend one of the three churches. Flower Ridge, Campground, or Rocky Hill. Trust me. It's a lot better live and in person and with everybody gathered as the church, the body of Christ. Again, always important for any gathering of the body of Christ, we come to the Lord in prayer. I'm pretty sure that I have said at every service in one way or another, uh, indeed, I hope you have affirmed with me uh, the statement, we believe in prayer. Or I think I've said, prayer works. Our primary prayer, that our wills, our wills align with God's. As always, we pray for friends and family. Uh, we pray for those on our prayer list. We pray for our leaders. We pray for all God's people. In this time of pandi pandemic, we pray for our world. Again, at this time, I invite you to bow in reverence as we pray. I invite you to join me in conclusion with the Lord's Prayer. Let us pray. Holy Father, we have arrived at the final Sunday in April. This year, the month of Palm Sunday, it happened this year in April. Uh, the first week of this month was Holy Week. And then there's Easter Sunday. And we have not darkened the door of our home churches in almost a month. For some of us, this marks the most Sundays in a row in our whole life to not be able to go to church. But Father, I think we're beginning to see a little light at the end of this big long tunnel. Father, next Sunday we're going to try to go to church. We'll stay in our cars. It's a, it's a first step. Father, we ask your blessings on this planned return. Even as state and local governments start opening things back up. Father, we ask for your presence. We wait for your blessings. Holy God, we seek to be disciples of Christ. We want to be about the business of the church where we are fishing 
and shepherding. Father, through the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, feed us with the word of God. Open our minds to your thoughts, O Lord. Teach us, Father, even in the middle of our toughest failures. Jesus will meet us wherever we are. He can bring us ashore to a warm fire. Even after a night of disaster. He prepares a way for us to go. Father, thank you for the faith that is ours. Thank you for the love we share. Thank you, Father, for the hope that is ours in life eternal. All these things we pray in the holy and blessed name of our Lord Jesus Christ. And now, Father, let us once again unite our voices as we pray the prayer. Talk to all disciples saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. This morning for uh, third Sunday of Easter, I, I've decided to, to stay in John's gospel. Uh, for the past two Sundays, including Easter morning, uh, we've been recounting the encounter of the risen Christ and last Sunday, our text, the last couple of Sundays, our text came from John chapter 20. So today we move on to chapter 21. Again, we pick up right where we left off last Sunday. Uh, when we get to chapter 21, the disciples are no longer in Jerusalem. They're no longer locked away, maybe up in the upper room for fear of the Jews. No, we're, we're back home. The fishermen have returned to the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. Wonder what might happen next. Reading from John 21, 1 through 19. After these things... Jesus showed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias. And he showed himself in this way. Gathered there together were Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, we will go with you. They went out and got into the boat. But that night, they caught nothing. Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach. But the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to them, children, you have no fish, have you? They answered him, no. He said to them, cast the net to the right side of the boat and you will find some. So they cast it and now they were not able to haul it in because there were so many fish. The disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. When Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on some clothes, for he was naked, and jumped into the sea. But the other disciple came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, only about a hundred yards off. When they had gone ashore, they saw a charcoal fire there with fish on it and bread. 
Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish that you have just caught. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore full of large fish, a hundred and fifty-three of them. And though there were so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said to them, Come and have breakfast. Now, none of the disciples dared to ask him, Who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. Jesus came and took the bread and gave it to them and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. When they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than thee? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Feed my lambs. A second time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you, you, you know that I love you. Jesus said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter felt hurt because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Very truly, I tell you, when you were younger, you used to fasten your own belt and to go wherever you wished. But when you grow old, you will stretch out your hands and someone will fasten a belt around you and take you where you do not wish to go. He said this to indicate the kind of death by which he he would glorify God. After he said this to him, after this he said to him, follow me. It is our custom to say the word of God to the people of God, and we say thanks be to God. In our text this morning, Simon Peter says, I'm going fishing. And the rest of the disciples say, uh, we're going with you. How many of you like to go fishing? Some do, some don't. Now, don't misunderstand Simon Peter. When, when most of us say, I'm going fishing, that means, that means I'm, I'm taking the day off. You know, this is something I will enjoy. No, Simon Peter means something else. He means, he means, I'm going back to work. I'm going to try to get things back to normal. I want to, I want to do what I do. Now, you know, I think of all times in our lives, most of us, like Peter, just want things to return to normal. And a whole bunch of us just want to go back to work, you know, out to eat, uh, uh, back to church. Yeah, Simon Peter just wanted things back to normal. I mean, for the past three years or so, traveling with Jesus, life had really been different, don't you think? And the last week or so, the arrest, the crucifixion, the resurrection, things had been different beyond compare. So, here we are, chapter 21, the Sea of Galilee, the Sea of Tiberias, same place, different name. The disciples have really come in obedience 
to the instructions of Jesus, go and tell my disciples that I go before them to Galilee. So, the first Easter was over. The disciples were no longer in Jerusalem, cowering in fear of the religious authorities. No, they were back home in Galilee. But Jesus, their dear friend, their leader, the source of all their hopes, was dead. And you know, although he'd apparently already appeared to these disciples in his risen form, uh, that doesn't at this stage seem to have made very much difference to them. I mean, I don't know. I don't know. Uh, perhaps, perhaps they believed they'd somehow left him behind in Jerusalem. I mean, you know, they're Jewish. You know, Jews, Jewish people believe that's, that's where God is, in the temple, in the Holy of Holy, in the box, you know. Perhaps they were, I don't know, their minds were still overly bound by time and space. That's where he died. That's where we saw him. That's where we left him. But you know, it sounds as though they don't know quite what to do with themselves. So, you know, they fall back to a familiar place. Work. Yeah. I'm going fishing, says Simon Peter. And you can almost hear the relief in the voices of the others as they quickly agree, you know, we'll, we'll come with you. Yeah, we'll come with you. Something to do, you know, anything to take their minds off of their loss, anything to feel that aching void. But, you know, somehow it doesn't really work. They, they don't, they don't catch, they don't catch anything. Nothing. You know, last Sunday I, I talked about, in the scripture with Doubting Thomas, you remember? I talked about how faithlessness, fear, and frustration had always been a part of the Easter story. Indeed, there will always be a Doubting Thomas in the crowd. Well, look what happens next. After the faithfulness, fear, and frustration experienced in Jerusalem, these fishermen come home to what? Failure. F faithlessness, fear, frustration, and they get back home, they go fishing. Failure. Yeah, they try to get things Back to normal. And, and, and you know, think about it. For these men, I mean, they were professional fishermen. You get what I'm saying? To fish all night long and not catch a thing? You know, that must have been a rather unusual experience for them. Like, you know, the world had not really sort of flip-flopped back into normal yet. But I don't know. You know, I sort of think of it like this. I'm pretty sure that it was Jesus' plan <laughs> not for them to catch a single fish. I mean, how else would he know? Standing there on the bank, all the, how else would he know that they had caught nothing all night long. I mean, look, look at this conversation again, right? Just after daybreak, Jesus stood on the beach, but the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to him, Children, you have no fish, have you? And they answered him, No. This is the way I think about it. It is not a miracle so much as it is a supernatural exercise of power through natural means. <laughs> or in other words, 
There is no question that our Lord summoned these fish to be there. And fish, apparently, unlike men, obey their Lord. Oh, little something information here. Did you know that the expression, even that's not really exactly right, but let's think about it like this. Did you know that the expression by hook or by crook originated in the 21st chapter of John? A hook is the symbol of a fisherman, while a crook is the symbol of a shepherd. So that in this concluding chapter of John's gospel, here we have symbolized the two ministries of the church, fishing and shepherding. You ever thought about it like that? As we should know, that's how God's work gets done, by hook and by crook. So the fishermen have been fishing all night long. And they ain't even got a nibble. How unusual. Faithlessness, fear, frustration, and now back home, failure at what you do best. So here... The Gospel of John gives us a picture of what Jesus wants to teach us first about the work of fishing for people. Around here we say fishing for men. Failure. You see, failure is a very demoralizing thing. I mean, some of you have tried hard to accomplish something. Like these fishermen, you have expended much energy and utilized all your resources and gained nothing in return. And failure is a painful experience. But very valuable lessons can be gained through it. You see, this night of failed fishing was not without its lessons its benefits. Listen to this quote. We can do worse than fail. We can succeed and be proud of our success. We can succeed and burn incense to the net. We can succeed and forget the hand whose it is to give. Or to withhold, to kill, or to make a lie. You know, people who think they've done it all by themselves are a dime a dozen. Yet nothing is more revealing of human ignorance than the claim to be a self-made man. That is to take for granted all, all that has, has been provided throughout their lives without giving a thought for who provided it. So they fished all night long and nothing. Failure is often the only test by which the real worth and quality of a man or a woman can be tried. But you know, God has a way of turning our failures into something different. Because see, gradually, after this long period of darkness, light began to dawn, figuratively, literally, in this story. And as the light increased, so there in the distance, they were able to see a figure standing on the shore. 
I mean, you know, perhaps, perhaps he'd been there all the time throughout the entire period of darkness. But they hadn't been able to see him until the darkness began to lift. Whatever the case, by the time they spotted him, he had a fire going and fish cooking. And where did he catch fish? He had some bread. And one version of the Bible includes, and if y'all knew anything about pers me personally, because I'm a beekeeper. One version of the Bible includes that he had some honey and honeycomb. So he must have been there for quite a while. Well, inevitably, as in almost all the resurrection stories, don't ask me. They fail to recognize Jesus. But even so, they follow the instructions of this stranger. I don't know, perhaps they thought his distant vantage point on the shore will give him a better overview of the situation. Maybe. I mean, true, it's, it's often easier for some stranger to look at a situation from a distance with fresh eyes and pick out what needs to be done. While those deep in the situation can't see clearly enough to decide on the right course of action. And that's not just about fishing. You know, there's, there is two ways to get something out of focus. It can be too far away or it can be too close. Fortunately, the disciples aren't too proud to follow the stranger's instructions. They cast their nets just a, a little bit differently. They shift their position, as it were. And that small shift makes all the difference. Just that little bit makes all the difference. And they did. And they looked. And they thought. And that small shift. And again, we're not just talking about fishing. But the nets are filled to over flowing and it's at that moment that again the beloved disciple the one who's a little bit more thoughtful a little less brash a little less reactionary the one who saw the grave clothes who understood what it meant the one who had the insight to believe to believe he makes the connection again, which seems so obvious to us with the benefit of hindsight. And he goes, what? It's the Lord. It's the Lord. We haven't left him behind in Jerusalem after all. He's here. He's here. He's here. Of course, when I'm, I'm living through darkness... Unable to see who's standing there. And some person or some institution or something suggests that I might shift my position just a little bit. You know, it, it isn't so nearly obvious that it might be the Lord. I mean, you know, first of all, I have to find the humility to follow what, what might seem like a useless suggestion. Cast your nets on the other side. Yeah, right. We've been fishing all night, all of Cashard. All right. We hadn't thought about that. It's only later when I see the results and I begin to recognize God's hand and realize he was there all alone. But see, once the suggestion's made, once Jesus is named. It, it is the Lord. 
all the disciples instantly recognize the truth. And they all re react differently as people do. Simon Peter, impulsive Peter, immediately goes overboard, figuratively and literally. But there's something I can't help but admiring about that, you know, instant headlong rush towards Jesus. But they can be quite irritating, can't they? Those, those that go overboard, sometimes they find themselves in deep water, have to be rescued, as Peter did on previous occasion. And very often they seem to leave others to do the donkey work, you know, the drudgery, as they're off following their heart's desire. You see, while Peter goes overboard, the others are left to pull in the boat and drag in the net full of fish. Well, Peter does go back and help when they get to shore. But Interestingly, interestingly, Jesus is concerned with their material comforts, with warmth and food and fellowship. What? more welcoming sight can there be when you come in from a long, cheerless, cold, and wet night than a fire and breakfast cooking. So that this is, uh, this is still about fishing, isn't it? Several, several things here have parallels in the work of fishing for people. First, notice that Jesus supplied the original fish and bread for this breakfast. When the disciples landed on shore, the fire was a burning. The fish and the bread were lying there prepared, ready to eat. This is the way that John's gospel suggests to us that all we have comes from the hand of God. We did not provide this world or the food that is in it. We do not provide the opportunities that come our way. Many of them come to us what we call right out of the blue. Behind all things, the hand of God has already been at work. He has already put us in the right place, leading us into situations we ha could never have designed for ourselves. We operate by his grace, by his amazing grace. And according to his efforts, Jesus is Lord. But notice, notice that Jesus then invites the disciples to bring some of the fish that they caught. Do you see? This beautifully expresses the way God works with us. We are given the privilege by God to be co-workers with him. The wonder of this is that God, who could easily do it all by himself, nevertheless gives us the great privilege of being co-workers with him. If people are having a bad time, it's often just like what Jesus did. It's often physical comfort that they need. You know, perhaps just the presence of, of another human being. Maybe a, a, a warm place. Some breakfast, you know. Maybe, maybe even dessert. Sweet like honey. Kind words are like honey, sweet to the soul and healthy for the body. 
And oh yeah, let's don't forget, they did catch 153 fish. You can tell this is a real true st uh, fish story. They count them. 153 big old fish. So, uh, of all the details, why the detail of 153 fish? Why, why, why? You know, almost all the commentators agree that John must have had a reason for giving this specific number. But thing is, nobody really knows. I've, I've heard several explanations myself, you know, uh, is there a symbolism or is it just the fact that he, they caught 153 fish? Not 152, 153. I don't know. One of the more best explanations, one that I like the best, and I would say probably the most likely answer, listen to this. The folks, <clears throat> the folks who lived around the Sea of Galilee widely regarded that there were, get this, 153 kinds of fish in the sea. So that, symbolically speaking, that was God's way of saying that the gospel of the resurrection of Jesus Christ will catch every kind of fish there is. The gospel is a universal gospel, right? It is for everybody, no matter, no matter what their background, their color, their culture, their education, fresh water, salt water, whatever. The same gospel is designed for men and women everywhere on earth. No matter what kind of fish we may be dealing with, they can be caught by the gospel net. Well, in the final passage of our text, John now turns to the work of shepherding. Yeah, Jesus combines the ideas of fishing and shepherding with the words that Jesus speaks to Peter. In short order, Jesus says, Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Now, clearly, this encounter for Simon Peter was a kind of threefold parallel to his three time denial of Jesus. So that, you know, three times Peter denied his Lord, and three times he is asked, to affirm his love. So remember, here we have symbolized the two ministries of the church, fishing and shepherding. I, I, I like the commentary in my Wesley Study Bible. It says this, it says, once caught, fish become sheep. Once caught, fish become sheep. Now, we've gone from fishing. Here is the chief work of a shepherd. Jesus says to Peter, what do you say again? Feed my lambs, tend my sheep, feed my sheep. Feed my lambs. Feed my lambs. Teach the children. Don't wait for them to grow up. You should teach children from the word, from the beginning, what life is really all about. Feed my lambs. Then he says, tend my sheep. Now, the word here, tend, it means, it means watch over them. It means guard them. You could even say, shepherd my sheep. Yeah. Peter, Simon Peter, will later write in his first letter. Listen to this. 
Feed the flock of God which is among you, taking the oversight thereof, watching out for them. 1 Peter 5.2 Finally, Jesus says what? Feed my sheep. You know, the grown-up ones. The instrument of feeding, teaching the Word of God. And, and you're grown up. We're, 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 talking about, we're talking about the meat of the Word, not the milk. Open their minds to the thoughts of God. But you see, for Peter, following Jesus would involve more than teaching. It would involve uh, more than preaching, feeding, yeah. It would ultimately involve pain, suffering, privation, and death. I mean, you know, clearly this book, this gospel, was written after Peter's death as John actually records the way Peter would die. Verse 19. Jesus is saying that preaching and teaching the word of truth in a mixed up world like ours will call for sacrifice. This is how the church should operate. We are to fulfill the gifts God has given us. He will put it together. We are not in competition with anybody. We do not have to struggle for position. We each have been given a ministry. Not only leaders, preachers, and teachers, but to everyone has been given the gifts of the Spirit. And they define our ministry. Simon Peter said, I'm going fishing. The other disciples said, we're, we're going with you. F feed my sheep. Feed, feed, feed my lambs. T tend my sheep. Feed my sheep. Amen. We appreciate y'all being a part of this last uh, time with us. This last uh, time that we're on YouTube. We'll see if that's the way that it really is. We think that it is. We thank you for joining us. Uh, I would really like to say a big Thank you again to Case Fulcher for his uh, helping us put out this. It's his uh, computer smarts and his uh, technical direction that has given us the ability to keep on having services like we are. But we really appreciate the ability to do that. And like I said, we are planning on having drive-in, stay-in-your-vehicle church services. Next Sunday morning, you arrive at the appropriate time. Please arrive early. And uh, we'll see if we can slowly but surely try to get things back to normal. We appreciate you being, again, a part of this. Receive this blessing with dismissal. Listen to these words. Let us pray. God, be in your head and in your understanding. God, be in your eyes and in your looking. God, be in your mouth. And in your speaking, God be in your heart and in your thinking. God be at your end and at your departing. All of these things we pray in Jesus' name. And God's people say, Amen.